recording. Excellent. All right. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Chow. Uh, as, I, uh, as I said, I'm Photos. I'm one of the C3s. Uh, I have an interest in echocardiography. Uh, I also have an interest in, in physics. So I want to apologize in advance uh, that this is probably going to be the world's most boring talk, uh, mostly because it, it requires a lot of algebra skills and uh, a lot of math. But we're going to try to make it as engaging as possible. And, and I think in the, in, the, in the quest for knowledge in this particular talk, I was able to find a lot of stuff that I didn't really understand. Um, so I hope that I can impart some of that wisdom on you. And if you have already understand the physics of echocardiography, I hope this is a, a nice little refresher. So without further ado, uh, we're going to go to uh, Fulti's Fun Physics. These are my learning objectives. Uh, I'm hoping that we're going to get some basic concepts of ultrasound. I'm going to discuss the physics behind sound waves and how to create that into an image. And then we're going to use some of that information to like mash it all together to talk a little bit about everyone's favorite valve, uh, the aortic valve, uh, and how it can be interpreted in the context of stenosis. So, making waves. So this is, uh, this is it. This, we're, we're getting into it. Uh, so there's many ways to think about this. Uh, you know, it, waves in general, there's a lot of stuff out there about the, the physics of waves, and, and I'm sure a lot of people just PTSD back to <clears throat> their high school days. But in essence, what you're thinking about is you're thinking about this kind of oscillating energy uh, that if you look at the top bar here uh, of those kind of grayscales, what you're seeing is whatever medium it's going through, air, water, human tissue, whatever it is, you get these bands of what they call rarefication and compression. And they, they kind of coincide with the peaks and troughs of this energy, which is this waveform that we're sending. And so whenever you get to the top of this waveform, all right, and you can kind of see at the top here close to compression, uh, all of the energy that's in that waveform has actually kind of brought everything a little bit closer together. And so those gray scales have become a little bit more towards the black. And then when the amplitude is further away from it or the furthest away or kind of, you know, furthest away from the baseline, you get this rarefication or you get the separation of these things. Um, and so defining a little bit further on, we have to think about two big concepts and one of them is amplitude. So amplitude is the size of the wave, right? Um, and especially from the peak to the trough. Uh, and, you know, the, if you think about it in sound waves, uh, it's correlating to loudness. So a bigger amplitude means more energy, which means louder to the ears. Um, in essence, it actually is defined as where kind of the, the peaks and troughs of these maximum compressions are. And it's useful to think about it in that distinction and not necessarily in just the size of the wave, because we talk about sound a lot and sound changes uh, in, in human tissue. Um, and so, because you think about amplitude as as loudness in 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 our in our world in echocardiography, the loudness that we get isn't actually noise. What we actually get is a, a grayscale. So we get more or less grayscale uh, with the size of the amplitude of the of the waveform. And we all know that the amplitude of these waveforms are measured in decibels. And decibels are a logarithmic scale, which we don't have to get into. So now that we know what the height of the wave is, we can talk a little bit about the wavelength. And the wavelength is very important because it's a concept that it ties itself into something called frequency. So the wavelength is defined as the distance in time or how long it takes to get from one compression band to another compression band. Uh, and if you put all of these wavelengths together over a certain amount of time, you get frequency. Okay, so the frequency, we talk about frequency in Hertz. Uh, so it's a concept that a lot of people have heard before, but may not necessarily have kind of put all of that, that together. And it's important because the wavelength will dictate a lot about how we can look at or how we can use physics to interpret things that are, are very reproducible. So things that can reflect waves. Um, so that's kind of the basics, some of the basics. And then we're going to get to this other concept of propagation velocity. So <clears throat> you have the wave. You have a wavelength, you've generated a certain amount of energy to make this wave, uh, and then you have to figure out how fast that wave, uh, you know, or in this case, this sound wave, uh, can go through a specific medium, all right? So like, uh, as I said, going through air is different than going through water, is different than going through mud, uh, 
And so when we think about the human body and we talk about heart, uh, the value that we get for that after you know, many experiments is about 1,540 meters per second, okay? But the important concept isn't as much stuff that that sound wave, although, or sorry, the propagation medium, uh, the propagation velocity, because reality is that that's fixed, right? Unless you're doing an ultrasound on an alien, uh, everyone is going to be human. So you're going to have a very standard number there. But what's important is that the propagation velocity is actually proportional to frequency and wavelength. And uh, like we said, frequency and wavelength are intimately related because frequency is how many wavelengths you have in a certain amount of time. And so if you take that formula, frequency times wavelength equals propagation velocity, and do some fancy math, um, you, and put in some constants, like we know the 1,540 meters per second, you'll notice that wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency. And so that's a really key concept, and I think that's like the, the main part of the basics of this physics is trying to remember that they're inversely related, okay? And they're inversely related as compared to a constant, so they're not exactly linearly related, they're slightly offset. But so, then you can ask me, like, fully, like it's 8 or 9 a.m. on a Thursday, like, why do I care? Uh, and, and that's a really good question, because you have to think about the waves not only in their amplitude and their frequency uh, but in conjunction with each other so that whole concept packaging it together is important because it gives you an understanding of how we can see things and so using the principles of wavelength and frequency and propagation velocities we have to kind of touch base on what we call spatial resolution so we, we have this device, we're gonna call it a magical device for now that makes, makes these waves at a specific frequency and a specific amplitude. Um, and we have to figure out how that's important because when waves kind of get generated, we can, get, we can shoot them onto something, right? The pericardium, a knee, uh, you know, the ocean floor, um, and we can wait for them to come back. And if we do that long enough, we can actually get a sense of what's going on. To get, to get to that, we have to remember why all these concepts are important. And it talks a little bit about spatial resolution. So in echocardiography, we talk about spatial resolution as being the ability to distinguish two points in space. And it sounds silly, um, but it is actually really difficult to do that because different sound waves or different ultrasound waves with different frequencies and different wavelengths actually have very different characteristics. And it's really important because this is actually a lot of the basis of why we have artifacts in echocardiography. So there's two types of uh, resolutions or spatial resolutions that we talk about. We have the axial or the longitudinal and the lateral. With the axial resolution is really the ability to distinguish two discrete points that are parallel to the ultrasound beam. And we'll, I'll show you an example of that. The lateral resolution is that you're able to differentiate two discrete points that are perpendicular to the direction of ultrasound. Um, if you think about the axial spatial resolution as the ability to kind of see multiple things in one specific line, all right? So instead of, like, let's say you had three dots and they were all spaced apart, uh, do you, does the machine look at it as just one dot because of the wavelength or does it look at it as three dots and they're all kind of lined up one in front of the other and then the lateral is the same but now they're next to each other instead of behind each other so what do i mean by that so there's these are these are kind of the concepts that are important because they tie into this wavelength idea so the axial resolution which we'll look at on the right and we have two fictitious transducers that we're just going to call them a black box for now and you can see that the wavelength uh, uh, on, on the axial resolution part, so between transducer A and transducer B are different. There are more, so it's a higher frequency and a shorter wavelength, right? So, so the wavelength itself has gotten closer together. That means the frequency of the wavelength has increased because of that inverse relationship uh, in transducer A. And transducer B has a lower frequency or higher wavelength type of um, signal and it's important because we talk a lot about frequency all right uh when we're doing ultrasound we're like oh what's the you know what's the frequency of this ultrasound probe no one talks about the wavelength of this ultrasound probe because no one actually does the math to it but it's important because again they're inversely related so 
in transducer A, you can see that they've created this, these little boxes on the left in the line of all of the little troughs uh, of the wavelength, all right? So the bottom parts of each of these wavelengths on the side. And when, when the wavelength is shorter, i.e. the frequency is higher, what you see is that when the wave goes through point A and goes through point B, it's two discrete wavelengths or two discrete amplitudes of the wavelength. Whereas if you look at the transducer B, that wave from bottom to bottom, okay, so from the dot to the dot on the other side of the, of the, of the uh, image um, is actually in the same wavelength. And so the important bit here is that A and B for transducer B will look like one object because it's within that one wavelength, all right? Lower frequency, higher wavelength. And transducer A, you're going to see two discrete points, all right? Because they're going to be two discrete wavelengths apart or two wavelengths or at least one wavelength apart so that the machine has time to figure out what that is. And it's not kind of sampling only just one box. And that's a key concept, all right? Because again, we have to think about it as like what we do. So it implies that if you have higher frequency, okay, uh, you, <clears throat> you have a shorter wavelength, but you also have better axial resolution. And we're gonna get to the pitfalls of why we can't have an infinity amount of, of, of uh, frequency, but the reality is the higher the frequency, the better your axial resolution is, okay? And that's because you guys, you have more waves to sample the two discrete objects that are very close to each other. As opposed to lateral resolution, uh, if you think about lateral resolution as how far these, so these waves, they don't actually come out in a straight line. They come out in a bit of a cone. And as this cone expands, all right, as you get further and further away from this transducer, you actually will be at, you know, distant objects, the things that are furthest away from this transducer are gonna have the higher chance of being within that same fan, all right? Uh, like we see in the middle picture here where those two dots at B are in the same zone in that kind of grayish zone in the middle. Uh, whereas if you get closer to this transducer, you actually have two discrete points at A because there are two different kind of expanding cones uh, of the wave signal. So like it shows on the image screen, A is two discrete points because it's two discrete wave kind of wavelets that have, that have sample this area and B because it's actually far away uh, is actually going to look like one object. So it had, doesn't it doesn't have as much to do with the wavelength and the frequency, but it does give you an essence and understanding of why when we look at things in echocardiography, things that are closer to the probe are easier to differentiate than things that are further away from the probe. Uh, and that's helpful because then you can understand why artifacts exist because the further you go away or the deeper you want to go into a structure, the harder it is to differentiate between two, uh, two signals and, and you have to think about that. This is another way of looking at it. So just one ultrasound beam, uh, transducer creating all this. So these are kind of all these fans that are coming out uh, and of the, of the ultrasound transducer. And at the very, very top with those two red dots, there's a lot of density of these ultrasound waves that are fanning out. And in so doing, they're actually two discrete points. So it's like the thing we saw before where A and B would be separated because two different ultrasound waves have actually generated those images or reflected those images. Whereas if you take the red dots at the very bottom, there's not a lot of density of ultrasound waves down there. So we're just gonna look like one object. And similarly, the axial resolution is the same that we discussed before with the green dots, but it actually has to do with the frequency of the sound waves, right? So that's gonna be the frequency dictates the wavelength and the wavelength dictates how much we're gonna be able to distinguish two parallel points. Um, so, you know, things that determine these things. So like we said, axial resolution is gonna be the, the pulse length and the frequency, all right? So that's important. The lateral resolution is going to actually be dictated by the beam width. So it's going to, that's going to be fixed by either the transducer itself, so how big the transducer is and how much the phase array can look around. Um, it's also going to be dictated by the depth, like we said, and it's going to be dictated in some part by the gain. 
And then we're not going to get into the other aspects of the contrast and temporal resolution, but they're also something that's important as well. So then, again, you can tell me, like, who cares? But the reality is, like, it's important because when you know how to generate a wave and you know the properties of the wave, you can understand what we're seeing on the screen. So here's a little cartoon image of an ultrasound being beamed close to the apex of the heart. Um, and the, the point is that things that, so the, the ultrasound is actually really good at differentiating uh, the borders between the things. It's actually very helpful when the ultrasound beams that's getting shot gets reflected against different types of media. And what I mean by that is that the, this, the interface between the pericardium and the epicardium which you can see on this little digital screen looks like a white line, is going to be much better in their contrast than the actual uh, endocardium itself. And then the endocardium is going to be differentiated much better from the cavity of the left ventricle because you have a transition point. So every time there's a transition point in the density of the subject, uh, you get a much more better or brighter picture because more reflection happens at that interface between two different types of media. And that's also important because it is a lot of the basis of why we see artifacts, right? So because different uh, surfaces or different uh, tissues in the body can reflect and refract waves differently, you can actually get different types of artifacts because it's actually uh, trying to get through a different medium. And we're not, we're not going to get into the, the physics of that, but you can imagine just for a second how many times you've looked at an ultrasound of parasternal long axis where you're seeing this lovely deep parasternal long axis shot and then for some reason there's another heart that's beating in kind of the bottom left corner again. It takes you a few seconds to realize they're not Klingon and then you realize, oh, that's probably just a reflection of the heart that we were seeing there. And that happens because uh, of the reflection of those ultrasound waves, um, actually the refraction of those ultrasound waves on a very, very uh, easily uh, bright pericardium, uh, and usually the posterior pericardium because it acts more like a mirror than it acts as anything else. But anyways, we're not going to get into that, but just keep that in mind as to how that happens. So we know how to generate a wave. We know some of the properties of waves. We know how the ultrasound waves and frequency are important and how we can differentiate two different points in space. Um, there's one more concept that we're going to have to get into, which is, again, some more boring math. Don't worry, there's not going to be a test at the end of this. And it's going to be a little bit about um, the, the technical aspects of making an ultrasound beam. Because what happens is it's not infinite, right? Like in physics, we talk a lot about like, oh, well, this light source is going to shoot a beam into infinity and you know, we're gonna be able to, to do some measurements of it. But we are constrained um, by the limits of our, of our reality. And so what we'll see is that the, there's going to be some properties of the ultrasound beam within the same ultrasound beam that are gonna change. And this, this concept of near field and far field is important because it talks a little bit about the, the properties of the waves themselves. And as you can see here, um, any ultrasound wave, that doesn't matter what it's generated from, curved probe, straight probe, whatever it is, is going to have a fairly parallel near field. And then there's going to be a point in which those ultrasound beams are going to start to diverge. And that's going to be your far field. And we can see things a lot better in the near field than we can in the far field. And we'll also see that the near field is inversely related to the wavelength, or thus inversely inversely related to the frequency. So if you have a wavelength that's very, very short, that near field is going to be very, very long. If you have, uh, and vice versa, okay? And so you can say, well, why do I still, why do I care? And the important bit about why you care about that is because when you think about lateral resolution, and you have these parallel beams of ultrasound, those are going to be able to be much more efficient at figuring out distances, right? Things that are parallel, oh, sorry, perpendicular to the, uh, to, the, to the ultrasound beam. Whereas if it diverges, it becomes a little bit more challenging because it introduces a new layer of angles in the ultrasound waves and it changes the distance against this transducer. So we've talked a lot about the transducer. Let's talk a little bit more. So piezoelectric, you know, you can't go through a talk with me without me quoting something that's Greek. So here we are. Piezoelectrics is, in fact, the hybridization of Greek and English. 
and piezo means uh, it's uh, actually pressure, um, and electric is uh, electric. And so, what the what the device does is it, it's uh, piezoelectric crystals. All right, so they're properties of specific crystals made on semiconductors that can either generate um, with an electrical current can generate an ultrasound wave, right? These piezoelectric, piezoelectric crystals can vibrate at a certain frequency dictated by the amount of energy that this device gives, the ultrasound machine. And it can similarly receive uh, waves of energy, all right? Uh, not electrical energy, just sound waves, and vibrate in a way that that creates an, uh, uh, an electrical signal, all right? And so it does both, it can, it can kind of, listen and it can also receive and that's an important concept to make because that's what it's always doing it's always listening and it's always receiving and in fact ultrasound machines are mostly receiving so they generate a pulse and then for 99 percent of the time they're just listening to hear what's coming back um so like we said it generates a pulse at a specific wavelength all right and then between these pulses is its listening period. So it's gonna send a little pulse and it's gonna wait. And then it's gonna send a little pulse and it's gonna wait. It's gonna send a little pulse and it's gonna wait. And then all of that sending and waiting, they can actually do the following math to figure out how far things is because we know all of the properties, right? We know the wavelength, we know the frequency, we know the speed, and we know how fast uh, sound waves carry through human bodies. So we can actually make, uh, so the picture on the right, is giving you that interpretation. So you have an ultrasound that's trying to look at something that's 20 centimeters away. An ultrasound pulse is created. We know its speed, we know its distance, all right? The ultrasound hits that you know, red block on the right, and then the echo comes back. And we know that that round trip is gonna take 40 centimeters, all right, because it's 20 centimeters away and 20 centimeters to come back. And all we need to do is figure out how fast it comes back. And because if we know if we can just wait and listen and figure out how long it takes to get back to us, we know the rest, we know the distance, we know the speed. And so we can make an assessment. We know the distance that it has to travel. Um, we know the distance, we know the speed that it can travel. And so we can actually just take out that distance component, know the time, and then put that together and figure out how far it is. And that's in essence what the ultrasound is always doing. It's sending a pulse. It knows how fast that pulse is. It's listening to see if uh, how long it takes to get back. And then based on that interpretation, it can give you a number of how deep that structure is in whatever you're looking at, okay? That's the key concept there, that we have all the variables that are necessary. And in fact, there's gonna be a relationship between frequency and depth, okay? So uh, high frequency, okay? So low wavelength is going to, not penetrate or not go into structures as as deeply all right based on this so high uh, low frequency sorry high frequency low wavelength is going to have a very short near field uh, and uh, high, uh, low frequency high wavelength is going to have uh, a high near field okay uh, oh sorry this is the opposite of that the point is that frequency is intimately related to this distance, this near field distance. So um, we know that it's going to be listening most of the time. We know that it's going to try to wait to see how long it takes to get back and then make an assessment of this distance. So then the last bit of this is talking a little bit of some of the last bit of this is talking a little bit about what a phased array is. Because we hear this often and we say, oh, well, did you use the phased array probe and all that kind of stuff. And what it essentially is doing is it's taking these piezoelectric crystals that are all kind of set up at the, the head of this, uh, this ultrasound probe, and it's activating them not at the same time. It's taking, it's, it's kind of going from step one to step two to step three, and step one is activating the very leftest piezoelectric crystal first, step three is activating the very rightest uh, piezoelectric first, and it's creating these waves that are actually not linear, they're more like a fan, right? You can actually imagine that if you watched all those ultrasound beams come down, you'll, you'll be seeing more of an area than just the exact parallel of these piezoelectric crystals, and that's what the phased array is. It's a phased network of these piezoelectric crystals that are creating a much more fan-like and instead of not very sh like straight shot, you know, like a, like a fire hose uh, coming out at you ultrasound beam. 
And what it does is it gives you a lot more kind of lateral resolution. It's able to see more with a very small footprint because you have to remember that the, the physics is dictating how the ultrasound beams are coming back and forth in the structures, but the anatomy is dictating how we can be able to see this. So like ideally you have a phase array that's as big as the structure that you're looking at, but there's ribs, people are small, the rib spaces are small. So you have to fit all of that stuff on a tiny little you know, uh, footprint so that you can get under the structures that you're looking at. And so the phased array actually brings us to kind of the basics of the, the first parts of ultrasound. So, you know, the first, first, first modes of ultrasound weren't these 2D echoes. They were, they were kind of these M mode echoes. And you can talk a little bit, of, I'm not going to talk a lot about them, but what I can tell you is that these M mode echoes were basically just one image looking at one cross section for a certain amount of time. And if you do that fast enough, um, like in the second image, and you can see all those blue little lines, if you do that fast enough, you can actually put together all of those images. And what you get, if you put together all those cross sections of an image in a phased array, kind of sweeping from left to right, you get the image of the heart. And that's, that's how we get the images on echocardiography. This ultrasound is constantly kind of sweeping and phase arraying, the, the phase array is sweeping and sweeping and sweeping and getting instantaneous information about what's going on in that structure. And it's doing it so fast that it's doing it well below the, 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 the cycle length, if you will, of the heart, right? Because we can see cystalline, we can see diastole, we can see all components in the, in the, in the middle of it. But think about it as constantly sampling MMOs or little cross sections and then smashing them all together for our, for our viewing pleasure. Okay, so the other key point here is that uh, adult echo probes uh, work at the two to four megahertz megahertz region. All right, so the uh, very high frequency, very very low wavelength. Okay, so let's do some math. I know people have been anxiously awaiting the math part, um, but let's say for for the sake of argument that we don't that we are right in the middle not two, not four megahertz, but three megahertz, okay? So then if we take that and we put it into the equation that we had seen before, that frequency and wavelength are related to each other with that constant, all right, the constant in, in the human body, 1,540 meters per second, we can actually do that math and figure out that the wavelength, all right, uh, of that is 0.513 millimeters, all right? That's the wavelength, very, very, very small wavelength. And remember when I told you that the wavelength itself is going to dictate how we're going to be able to see things that are kind of in parallel to each other. So that's kind of the spatial resolution that you're looking at for a three megahertz probe. You can differentiate <clears throat> essentially anything that's about half a millimeter apart from each other. Okay. If you increase your frequency, you're going to decrease your wavelength and you're going to be able to see more. But the problem is that as you increase the frequency and decrease the wavelength, the ultrasound beams aren't going to be able to propagate as far. Um, and uh, if they can't propagate as far, you're not going to be able to see as high a resolution deep into tissue. So there's always this balance between how much spatial resolution we can have based on our frequency and how much we want to see. So like people who are doing ultrasounds of the aorta, the abdominal aorta, that's 15, 20 centimeters away from the echo probe. That's much harder than people who are doing ultrasounds of the thyroid, which is going to be a few millimeters away from the ultrasound probe. So you can use different frequencies to get different spatial resolutions based on what you're looking at. And that's kind of the bottom line. And so if we actually put in the value of what the near field is, if we go to that first, first frequency, this, this equation here, um, we can actually figure out what that near field is, where we're getting the most kind of parallel uh, ultrasound beams without any evidence of divergence. And that's actually, that's actually at, at three megahertz, that's actually 4.8 centimeters. So for the cardiology residents who are on the, on the, on the line, whenever the uh, echocardiography technologist or anyone says, make them roll over, make them get onto their side, bring the heart to the chest, it's because you can actually utilize some of this near field advantages of the ultrasound probe because you can get the heart structure to be closer. And as such, that near field is gonna encompass more of the heart. And then you're actually gonna be able to see a lot more, which is kind of cool. Um, 
All right, so um, moving on a little bit from some of the how we make ultrasound waves, which I know was probably painful to most of you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can make ultrasound waves useful in cardiology. Okay, and then back in that part of the show. Uh, I know there's a very strong and long tradition of people never speaking on these talks, but I'm going to take a second to drink half a sip of water and ask you guys does anyone know who this beast of a human being is? A study returned to form, no one knows, um, or no one wants to talk, but that's okay. Because this beast is actually Christian Andreas Doppler. All right, this guy was something special, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about why he was something special. Because at the ripe old age of 38, <clears throat> one year after he was hired at the Prague Polytechnic, he gave a lecture to the Royal Bohemian Society of Sciences. And I'm not going to try to do the German version of this, but I, it, the translation is on the colored light of the binary stars and some other stars of the heavens. And his talk was, in fact, describing a lot of the principles of what we call the Doppler effects, okay? And so what is the Doppler effect? So he postulated that uh, observed frequency of waves depends on the relative speed of the source and the observer. Uh, the simplest way to think about this is if you're standing at the side of the road and an ambulance goes by you, you'll hear a change in the pitch of the actual noise itself because you're getting basically higher, uh, you're, you're basically moving the source. And by moving the source, you're actually changing the wavelength and the frequency uh, that's coming to your ear. Okay. So when it comes from light, not sound, but light, and in particular celestial bodies, which means that they're so far away that the position of Earth between those subjects is entirely irrelevant. So we can be assumed to be the person who's just standing at the side of the road. We're not actually moving. Um, that light coming from two sources, okay, that are very close to each other, um, will change its frequency and by in so doing change the observed color of the light that's coming back from them depending on how they're moving. And so, you know, he was a pragmatic human being. And so he looked up into the sky and looked up into the heavens and saw um, this binary system that you see in front of you. So it was called Albireo. It's, it's, the, it's the top star of the Cygnus uh, constellation that you can see on the right there. Uh, and you can see that these are binary stars, which means that they're so massive that their gravities are actually linked together and they're kind of spinning around each other at the center of their gravities. And one is moving away and one is moving towards us. And the one that's moving away from us and the one that's moving towards us have different colors. So it's one yellow and one blue. And that's kind of the basis of how we, he observed what he had postulated, that these light, these light coming off of these things have different wavelengths because one is moving away and it's going to be slightly longer and one's moving towards you and slightly closer. And that changes the observed light that's in front of you. Interesting side note, uh, it's the, the Cygnus uh, constellation is, and the star Beta Cygni of this Cygnus constellation was actually described by some medieval astronomers. And I'm not going to pronounce it because I'm sure I'm going to butcher it, but it actually was pronounced, uh, it was actually translated to be called the hen's beak. Uh, so people have been observing these types of things for a very long time. Uh, and it's kind of cool to think about, you know, people in the medieval Arabic world looking up into the stars, having names for these stars, and then eventually someone taking a telescope later on and figuring out that that was a binary system and you know, all that kind of jazz. Unfortunately, he died, um, like all things in the world, uh, they come to an end. Uh, he died on St. Patrick's Day, interestingly, March 17th in 1853. Uh, he was only 49. It was postulated that he had a, so he was a very sick person in general, and they think that he had a TB, uh, so he probably passed away from TB. So then, how do we use the Doppler effect of this observed change in the frequency or, in fact, the wavelength of stuff that's coming and going away from us? Well, we think about it as erythrocytes. So an erythrocyte, which is in the body, can actually reflect ultrasound beams, uh, and it can do so with the very consistent properties of the Doppler effect. And so, um, you know, we can look at this formula, which is basically the formula that was created to figure out, uh, you know, what the velocities of all of these things are, and in so doing, the frequency and wavelength, et cetera, et cetera. 
and we can actually plug in some values that we know. So we know the frequency of the emitted ultrasound because we can define that by the probe. We know the frequency of the reflected ultrasound because we can actually measure that with the piezoelectric crystals. Um, we know the ultrasound velocity of the tissue, which is again a constant. And then we have this cosine of the angle theta that is going to be dictating how uh, effective we are at being able to get that ultrasound beam directly back onto us. Because you can imagine that if you have an ultrasound beam that hits a perfect reflector perpendicularly, it will cut back at you perpendicularly. If it's a slight angle, what you're gonna get is you're gonna get only a certain amount of that ultrasound beam come back at you, and that certain amount is actually the cosine of theta. And so, People in the audience who are still awake will wonder, well, who cares? And then the answer to that is, well, the cosine of zero, so a perfectly perpendicular wave is actually one. So that actually makes this formula very easy. So when people are telling you to look at the flow of things, uh, you wanna be as, as parallel uh, uh, to the actual subject as you are, not perpendicular. You wanna be as parallel as you can because the parallelity, so there's no theta, means that it's a cosine of zero, which is equal to one. Perpendicular would be cosine of uh, 90, which would be zero. So that whole thing gets completely uh, negated. So, um, and so, you know, that's one of the important concepts of how we can figure out how things are moving. Uh, and then we use the Doppler effects to figure that out. So, blood, interestingly enough, doesn't like to do doesn't like to take turns, uh, just like NASCAR drivers. Uh, and this is a little animation to kind of tell you a little bit about what we're talking about. So when blood is flowing through a tube, uh, it has a choice. It, it, it usually likes to do things in laminar form or laminar process. And laminar means that all the little uh, erythrocytes, all of the stuff that's in the blood is moving in parallel. And that's more the right side of this animation, the downstream, where everything is moving in unison. There's no eddies or currents. You can see that the middle portion of that downstream is actually quite fast, and then things that are closer to the edge look a little bit slower, all right? And this is, this is, that's laminar flow. As opposed to before, the upstream, you have these eddies and these currents that are actually kind of making things a little bit more chaotic. So not only is it going from left to right, but within that surface, within that structure, all of the things are kind of swirling around with each other, and that's turbulent flow. And we can use that to our advantage to figure that out. So we have these laminar flow things that we talked about, and you can actually break down laminar flow like we saw in that video as the middle bits of that laminar flow work fastest, all right? They move fastest, and the stuff that's at the outside moves slowest. And you can actually create this parabola, so this parabolic motion where the tip of the parabola is the fastest and everything is kind of going behind it. And so it's important because we can actually estimate flow um, based on velocities, which we'll get to, and that's an important concept to think about. So whenever something is laminar, we know that the middle of that structure is going to be the fastest, okay? Whereas if you have a stenosis, like we see on the image on the right, all of that laminar flow, those parallel lines are gonna try to squish together and they're gonna to squish together down into this uh, stenosis, and then at the outside, they're actually going to create turbulence, like the other side that we, the, the first start side of the animation that we saw. And that turbulence is actually gonna be something that's gonna affect both the pressure and the velocity. And then whenever things get really, really close together, we can talk about the vena contracta. So that, mo that moment where all of those things are getting closest together, and we can do measurements on that with echo, uh, to figure out things like, you know, mitral regurgitation, or, you know, all these other fancy stuff. So uh, laminar flow, you get this ultrasound beam, and the ultrasound beam hits this laminar flow, and you can see on the right that it's going to create a Doppler spectral profile. And it's important because what you're seeing is actually the three layers of this parabolic motion, all right? You're seeing in the same spectral profile the lowest velocity, the mean velocity, and the highest velocity. Okay, so that's kind of how a laminar flow uh, Doppler spectral profile will look like where you have these grades of speed. And the reason we have grades of speed is because of the laminar flow, because the tip of that spectral profile is going to be the middle of that laminar flow with the highest velocity and vice versa. Right? So it's, it's kind of useful to think about that because that's what generates the spectral pro Doppler profile. It's not just a simple line, right? It's a, 
it's an envelope of, of different things moving at different speeds. So um, we're going to shift gears a little bit from the ultrasound in the last little while and try to talk a little bit about the tail of aortic stenosis. Okay, so let's get down to the brass tacks and put all of this stuff together, laminar flow, turbulence, Doppler effect, how we make waves, all that kind of stuff. So aortic stenosis, we know it's a progressive disease. Uh, we know that it, it, it has to do with the aortic valve, obviously. Here's a picture of the aortic valve on the left. We know that the prognosis uh, is poor if you do nothing, right? So those lines are telling you different types of parameters or different types of patients. So the, uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the NF is normal function, the LF is low function, so we're talking about left ventricular function, and then the HG is high gradient and the LG is low gradient. So if you have low flow, low gradient, which is the bottom line of the survival, your three-year survival is 50% at three years. It's, it's bad. Whereas if you do nothing and you just have kind of, uh, you know, this is talking a little bit about doing some kind of interventions with medical therapy. Uh, if you do nothing with on your just medical therapy alone, sorry, the left one is with surgical interventions as well. The right one is with medical therapy. If you do nothing alone, the prognosis is very poor. So we know that it's a highly prevalent disease. We know that it's progressive and we know that it has a high mortality if we do nothing. And we know that if we fix these aortic valves, they actually go back to similar proportions of what the population is like in regard to their mortality, depending on other parameters. But for the most part, they go to improve their survival curve to go back to kind of normal. So, more physics. So we're going to talk a little bit about the aortic stenosis. So think about aortic stenosis as a fixed obstruction, right? So the, the aortic valve is tight and it's not going to change. And so it creates an afterload, uh, and that afterload is seen by the left ventricle. And when we say afterload in both physics, uh, sorry, physiology as well as cardiology, we're thinking about it as the amount of wall stress of the LV, all right? So the amount of stress on the wall of the LV cavity trying to push out the, through a fixed obstruction is essentially what we can describe as, uh, as our afterload, okay? And so, we can see from this formula from Laplace's law um, that there's an inverse proportionality between the thickness of the LV and the wall stress. So if the heart wants to decrease afterload, okay, for a fixed obstruction, it wants to it wants to get better. It doesn't want to be at high wall stresses. What it has to do is it has to increase its thickness, right? So if you increase the thickness of the LV, you actually decrease the wall stress. And that's why we get patients who are coming in who are going to have aortic stenosis who have very, very thick wall ventricles. It's the compensation mechanism for a high afterload. It's that ability of the heart to only be able to kind of fix the wall thickness to improve its wall stress and in so doing become less afterloaded. So I thought that was a kind of an interesting segue to why we see the pathophysiology um, of, uh, of, of what we see in the LV cavity in the context of AS. It can decrease other parameters, but that's actually harder for the heart to do. And there's only a certain amount where you can actually get hypertrophy, in which case at that point it becomes too big uh, and it fails. And then that's when we start getting these patients who have like blown out dilated LVs in context of having severe AS. So you can't have a talk on physics and aortic stenosis without talking about the big man from Basel himself. This is Bernoulli, all right? And Bernoulli uh, was someone who was able to put a lot of the kind of physics behind kinetic and potential energy. And then at the time was talking about, you know, flow and flight and, you know, that kind of stuff. But for us, we can use it for echo. And so the Bernoulli principle is saying that for a closed system, okay, the kinetic and the potential energy all right, or kinetic or pressure energy is going to be the same, okay? And we know that that whole heart system is going to be the same. So the energy is neither going to be created nor destroyed. It's just going to be moved around into either kinetic or potential energy to balance itself out, okay? So we'll do some math, uh, like everyone loves on Thursday morning. And we know that this is the formula we were talking about. Right? So this is his formula here. The kinetic energy and potential energy in area one is equal to the kinetic and potential energy in area two. Okay. We know that K, so this kinetic energy is going to have a constant. It's going to be related to the density of blood and it's going to be related to the flow or the velocity of blood squared. Okay. We know that that density times 0.5 comes out to about four. 
So we know that the kinetic energy is going to look at about, it's going to be about 4v squared. You plug those 4v squared into the previous equation. You do a little bit of fancy mathematics to bring all the pressures to one side. You call that a pressure change, and we take out the four, and now we have the change in pressure is four times the square of the two velocities that we received in the beginning, okay? But V1 is usually much, 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 much smaller than V2, right? Because we know that that velocity is gonna be much smaller because that's gonna have a higher diameter and it's gonna have uh, that, power, that laminar flow. So we can kind of almost put it out of the equation if we make some assumptions about the speed of the jet that's coming out for an aortic stenosis, for example, it's about two and a half to three meters per second. And so if we do that, we can actually say that the change in pressure, all right, the pressure difference is gonna to equal to the four V squared. And we, that's an important formula in echocardiography. I know, it just, it's mind blowing. It's something that, you know, we need to keep in mind all the time. So these are the parameters that we look for in aortic stenosis and specifically in regards to the severity of aortic stenosis. So we have these kind of three big things that we look for, the peak velocity, the mean gradient and the aortic valve area. Fun fact for all those people who have just, you know, thought about other ways to look at aortic stenosis, you can actually dictate severe aortic stenosis by their calcium score. So that's an important thing, and it comes up on exams apparently all the time. But we're going to look at the severe AS category of this, this greater than four meters per second, a mean gradient of 40, and an aortic valve area less than one. Okay. So here is a Doppler spectral profile, a continuous wave Doppler that's right down, bang through the center of that aortic valve, all right? That aortic valve uh, and the flow is actually completely parallel to the ultrasound beam. So we know that cosine of theta is gonna be, uh, the angle theta is gonna be zero, so the cosine of zero is gonna be one. So we're gonna get the maximum amount, we can't overestimate it, we can underestimate it, but we can't overestimate it, but we know that maximum flow. You know, the tip of that is at four meters per second. So we already got one of the criteria that we were talking about right away just by looking at the flow that's coming off of this, right? One caveat to continuous wave Doppler before I do that is that it, you have to think about continuous wave Doppler as sampling that entire line for flow, right? It's not a specific area. It's whatever flow is in that whole line. And it's important because it's going to be really good at figuring out maximum velocities, right? It's looking at that whole, whole area and it's trying to tell you there is the spot in that line that you drew that is going at four meters per second. It doesn't tell you where, but it tells you that that's the maximum velocity, okay? So that's four meters per second, you know, let's call it four meters per second. We're already in a severe category there, but remember that we know that pressure, all right, like we saw from the big man from Basil himself is four V squared. So if we plug that into the V, we see that the highest pressure, the peak pressure is 64 millimeters of mercury, okay? And so you know, that's not in our calculations for the mean, which we wanted to figure out before, but it's important to think about that is that the peak pressure, the instantaneous peak pressure during that line at some point is at high as 64 millimeters of mercury. And so without getting into too much of the physics of it, we can understand that if you have something like this, which is looking at the amount of flow through a line, you can actually do some software or you can actually do some math, which we're not gonna get into, to figure out how much, um, how much pressure, how much flow is throughout a time interval. We call that the velocity time interval or VTI. And it's basically the area under this curve, okay? And what we can do is we can do some math to figure out what the area under that curve is and that'll pop out the mean gradient. And in this case, the mean gradient is actually gonna be greater than 40. So when you do that math, you can see that we're at four meters per second and we see that the mean gradient is higher than 40 millimeters of mercury, not the high peak instantaneous uh, which was at 64, okay? So then, so that's how you kind of do the, the flow and uh, the pressure, all right? That's how you get the pressure part of that. Now, there's also a third part of that, which is the area, which we're gonna have to do a little bit more math. And it's very similar in its concepts to what Bernoulli was talking about, but in this particular instance, we're actually going to be assuming that the amount of flow that's going between two spots is going to be the same regardless of the size of that what's going through. So um, the amount of blood that's going through, uh, for example, a stenosed aortic valve is going to be the same amount of uh, flow from one side to the other side. Uh, but it's going to be changes in pressure like we talked about with Bernoulli, uh, but the area is irrelevant. 
right? So A1 and A2 are still going to see the same amount of blood going through it. They're just going to be at different velocities and at different pressures. And so what we can do, we can do some little bit of algebra and figure out that the area of the aortic valve is now the area of the LVOT, which we can measure, right? So we can measure the, the size of the LVOT, the diameter of the LVOT, put it into a formula, which we know is going to be this formula here, and then that the radius is going to be the biggest component of that because it's squared. So that's why we have to have a very accurate and very consistent LVOT when we're looking at aortic stenosis from the same patient to the same patient, because you, you want to compare apples with apples. But if you put that number in, which we can measure, and you can also measure the flow, because we figured out that flow and pressure are related based on Bernoulli's principle, we can actually put all that information in here and get an aortic valve area, okay? And so that's the basis premises of how we can make the calculation based on VTI or the continuity equation on how we can get the aortic size. Now, it has its pitfalls, and its pitfalls are mainly the fact that if your LVOT is even slightly off from what it was previously, it starts to really mess up with some of the numbers. And then also being parallel or perpendicular to this flow is also going to be helpful too. Like the first example that I showed you, that was bang on exactly how you want to be as parallel as possible to get the maximum velocity. And therefore, you're not going to underestimate its velocity, therefore not underestimating its size. So the errors kind of keep carrying forward the more formulas you use with bad data. Last but not least, we're going to talk a little bit about recovery, okay? And this is a little bit more of a concept that's imperative to think about because we used to, so I'm growing up uh, and training in an era where echocardiography is the bee's knees, right? It's, it's what we do. Uh, this is what we use to, like, no one's going for surgery anymore without having an echocardiogram, like it's like for aortic, for any valvular disease, right? We're not just going by the auscultation anymore. And then we used to go by the uh, angiographic results. So everyone who needed to get evaluated for aortic stenosis would actually have to get an angiogram. And so what they found was, at the beginnings of ultrasound, they found that there's a really good correlation between what they found on echo and what they found in cat, right? So one is kind of the estimated and one is the observed. But there were a small population of patients that had a discrepancy. And that discrepancy was found specifically in patients who had smaller aortas um, and who may have had much higher flows. And what they found was that there's this concept in physics called, uh, sorry, pressure recovery. Okay, and the phenomenon is called pressure recovery. And I don't really want to get too much into this, other than giving a little bit of an analogy. Okay, so if you imagine there's a fire in a building, I hope. None, no one is in a fire building, but you, you imagine that you're in a building with a fire. There's only one exit, okay? Everyone is going to run to the door, and only one person can get through the door at the same time. So all of these people are trying to get through this one door. And so the speed of everyone right before the door is going to be very low because only one person can get, can get through. But the pressure is going to be very high because everyone's going to be trying to push each other to get through it. And so when you get what you do, you manage to get to the front, congratulations, and you get shot out the door, and now there is no one around you, all right, but you're gaining all of that speed that you had, that you're, you're gaining a lot of speed now, all right, but the pressure is going to start decreasing. And so this is kind of the idea of uh, pressure recovery. Um, you're, we are using, in echo, we are using flow, right? We are using the speed of stuff, the speed of erythrocytes in the vessels, to dictate how much pressure there is. But when you have someone, so in this example that's in front of you, you can see that the velocity in V1 is gonna be less than V2, right? People are starting to get to that door and slowing down. And then when they get through the door, they're gonna be fastest right when they get out the door and they're gonna to start to slow down again. And that's what our Doppler is seeing. Our Doppler is seeing the highest velocity, which is V3, that person bolting out of the door. But what happens is because there's so much space and because there's not a lot of stuff to push around, right? There's no people, there's not as much people outside of this, the pressure is actually lower and it's going to get higher the further you get down the aorta where you're gonna see a lot of the people who escaped uh, in the, in their, in the, from the building. And so the machine is going to be seeing the highest velocity and that velocity is gonna give you a high pressure but that pressure may not be what the actual pressure of the aorta is. And that phenomenon of being able to go through that, that pinhole and get to the other side um, and have a lot more space to dissipate your kinetic energy to become potential energy 
you're going to have a lower pressure than actually is observed because our Doppler is only going to see the highest velocity. It's not going to tell you if you're looking at V1, V4, or V2. It's going to give you the peak at V3, and that's going to be a higher than what the actual pressure at that gradient is. So it's a little bit difficult to wrap around your brain, but the reality is that happens more in people who have smaller aortas uh, or more people who have uh, higher flows, right? And, and it happens and sometimes uh, overestimates the amount of pressure. So that was a lot. Uh, I apologize for the incredibly boring physics and math talk, but I think it's important because if we understand the basic principles of where we get all this information, we can actually be better at utilizing it and understand its pitfalls as a, as a, as a modality. So thank you for listening. I couldn't have done this without giving some baby tax. So that's my baby, Eleni. She's, uh, she's uh, six weeks old uh, on Sunday. So uh, we are very happy with her. And this is a frustrating picture that my father took while he was on vacation uh, only a few days ago. So to remind me of how much good time he's having. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to talk and get any questions. So thank you, Potus. Very, very good job and uh, very comprehensive review. You actually gave two lectures in the, in the, uh, in the space of one. So thank you. And I uh, really love um, you know, your review of physics. You make it uh, simple and also um, uh, uh, down to earth. Uh, and uh, you made lots of great analogies and also uh, history as well. So you covered a huge ground. So um, thank you. And uh, uh, just uh, one, one, one suggestion is uh, never apologize for, for what you're going to say because uh, you know, it is actually very, very good. And, uh, and you've done a fantastic job. So it is a, um, uh, 59 just for all the sonographers and also the uh, residents and also uh, echo fellows. Um, in case you're doing any uh, of the uh, echo exam, uh, these, um, what photos actually has laid out, um, is going to be on the exam. So this is something that, uh, you know, I talked about quite a bit um, in the fellows um, morning review and, and uh, also, um, uh, for the sonographers, uh, there's always a physics section as well uh, that you have to know about uh, the 1450 meter per second and wavelength and cosine theta and all those things are very important. Um, it's, some of that will also appear in the basic cardiology exam, but not as much, but uh, something that you have to be aware of. But definitely on the ECHO exam, if you are doing taking the National Board of ECHO MBE. So any comments from my colleagues before we, we wrap up? Uh, we're right at nine, actually. <laughs>